Okay, I think we are live. Hello everyone, sorry for the inconvenience that we might have caused to anyone. So for the next talk, we have Dr. Ross King. Uh, he has obtained a BSc Honours in Microbiology from the University of Aberdeen and a PhD in Computer Science from the Turing Institute. He was formerly uh, he was uh, formerly the professor of machine learning, machine intelligence at the University of Manchester. His main research interests are in the interface between computer science and biology and chemistry. His robot scientist Adam was the first machine to hypothesize and ex experimentally confirm scientific knowledge. His new robot Eve is searching for drugs against neglected tropical diseases. His work on the, this subject has been published in top scientific journals like Science and Nature and has received wide publicity. He is also very interested in building non-deterministic universal Turing machines using DNA and computational aesthetics and computational economics. So we'll head over to this next talk on <coughs> automating science from Adam to the Nobel Turing machine by Dr. Roskin. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I apologize for uh, the confusion about the times. This was caused by Microsoft uh, thinking I'm in Sweden rather than the UK at the moment. So I'd, I'd like to take, talk today about uh, uh, automating science using AI. So first about science. So the, the motivation of my research is uh, to improve the efficiency of scientific research. And science is... Uh, one of the great products of human intellect, but it's also uh, essential to uh, the health and well-being of uh, humankind. And to me, the uh, the best hope of providing uh, healthy, uh, productive uh, living environment for human beings, so the, the eight to 10 billion people pr projected to, to be on the planet in the 21st centuries, is better science and technology. Artificial intelligence. So uh, AI uh, is being driven uh, by improved computer hardware. Uh, computers are still getting faster and faster. We're putting more and more computers on the same uh, chips, making them faster. GPUs have thousands of uh, little processors on the same piece of DNA of, of silicon. Uh, another great uh, technology driver is uh, the amount of available data. Computers are recording almost everything. This is true in science as well as in everyday life. And we're also getting better at writing AI software. So we understand uh, AI much better. We have new machine learning methods, deep learning, etc. So these three great technology drivers are pushing forward the advances in AI and especially in machine learning. I'm old enough to have been through a previous uh, hype cycle of AI uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, but I think this one uh, is different from previous ones. Uh, and what I think is mostly different about it is that it's uh, AI is the, uh, especially machine learning, is the core technology of uh, the biggest companies on the planet, the Google, Facebook, Amazon, and their Chinese rivals. And that was different from in the, in the past, where AI was more based around in universities, and the hype cycle was in the universities rather than making billions of uh, dollars profit for big companies. So that's a change. The application of AI to science is called scientific discovery. And I argue that AI systems have superhuman scientific reasoning powers. They can flawlessly remember vast numbers of facts. They can execute flawless logical reasoning. They can e execute near optimal probabilistic reasoning. Uh, they can learn from vast amounts of data which no human being can encompass. 
They can extract information, not read, but they can extract information from millions of scientific papers, etc. So these superhuman powers of AI systems are complementary to what human scientists can do. And I also argue that uh, scientific discovery, the application of AI to science, is a good application area for AI. Scientific problems are abstract, like games of chess and goal, where uh, AI systems are far superior to human beings now. So the abstract nature of the problems uh, suits AI systems. And scientific problems are also restricted in scope. Uh, to be a great scientist, you don't need to know about vegetables, you don't need to know about kings, you just need to know about that area of science. And for AI systems, they don't need to know about politics or anything else, they just need to know about science. And that really helps uh, to develop an AI systems so this restriction in scope. Another great advantage is that uh, nature is honest. By this I mean that when a computer or a human being does a scientific experiment, we're fairly confident that, that the external world is not trying to uh, mislead uh, the scientist. We may misunderstand the uh, meaning of the experiment, but we're fairly confident that the external world is not trying to uh, be malicious. And that's quite different from uh, other applications of AI, for instance, in uh, the business world, where many of the agents are malicious. And I'd also say that uh, it's one of the great tragedies of our time in that uh, many of the smartest people on the planet are spending their life uh, working on AI to develop better advertising or more addictive content for social media. And I think that's a, it's a great tragedy. The world is faced with many problems. We have coronavirus, we have uh, food shortages, we have horrible diseases, uh, we have poverty. And what are people doing? They are uh, developing better advertising. This is a tragedy. So I think uh, the study of science is a, is a worthy object of our time. I and mean, I, when I look back on my uh, career, I, I want to look back on that I've done something useful in my life, not uh, made a lot of money uh, developing advertising or weapons or something. And the generation of scientific knowledge is a, is a public good, at least if, if that knowledge is in the public domain. So the application of AI to science goes back uh, a long time, back to the early 60s and 70s in Stanford. Uh, Metadendril was arguably one of the first ever machine learning programs. It was learning about uh, mass spectrometry data. And the motivation for this was the Viking probes to Mars. Uh, Mars is very far away. Even at the speed of light, signals take uh, the order of about 10 minutes to get there. That means that they had this dream of uh, sending an autonomous system to, to Mars to do to research. Unfortunately, back in the 60s and 70s, they didn't really have the technology, the computing power necessary to do this. But they developed a lot of the techniques. So this project was led by Joshua Lederberg. He got the Nobel Prize for, for medicine. He basically discovered uh, sex and bacteria, which is the sort of basis of biotechnology. But he was also very interested in computer science, taught himself to program. Uh, and was also very interested in logic and formalizing science. Ed Feigenbein got the Turing Award, that's the uh, equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Computer Science, for his work on expert systems. Bruce Buchanan was one of the founders of machine learning. And Carl Jurassi should have got his, the Nobel Prize for his work on the birth control pill. So it was a stellar bunch of people working on Metadendril. Another highlight in the history of scientific discovery was the Bacon Project. Uh, this claim to uh, rediscover physics and chemistry. Uh, for example, Kepler's Three Laws of Planetary Motion. Uh, this was quite controversial because they were given up the system. Bacon was given quite clean data. It was quite different from the problem that Kepler faced. But nevertheless, it was an important milestone in this discovery science. And the leader of this project, Herbert Simon, he got the Nobel Prize 
for his work on economics and the Turing Award for his work on AI. So my contribution to this is what I call robot scientists, my contribution to discovery science. And a robot scientist is a computer a robotic system which can, in a sense, do simple scientific research. It can uh, do sort of simple cycles of scientific research. So you give the robot scientist background knowledge about an area of science. That knowledge is represented using logic and probability theory. The robot scientist has an automated way of forming novel hypotheses about that area of science, mostly using techniques from machine learning. The robot scientist can then automatically decide on efficient experiments to test these hypotheses. By efficient, I mean that they're the most efficient in terms of time and money, these uh, limiting resources. The robot scientist can then program a laboratory robot to actually execute the experiments. The robot can execute them, and then the robot scientists can look at the results of the experiment and then make the hypotheses more or less probable based on the results of the experiment, and then repeat the cycle. It can do this until there is only one theory which is consistent with the background knowledge and its experimental results, or it runs out of some resource. So that's the basic idea. You want to build a uh, physical artifact which can, in a sense, do simple scientific research. And what's the motivation for this? Uh, one motivation is philosophical. I, I'm very interested in what is science. And the idea is that if you can build a, a machine, an artifact, which does scientific research, then in some sense, you understand what science is. It's an operational approach to the, the philosophy of science. To understand something, try to build an artifact which does it. And that's similar to the motivation of AI where you try to understand intelligence by building physical artifacts which are intelligent. This is the, the great physicist Richard Feynman's blackboard at the time of his death. And you can read there what it says is, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So it's a similar operational approach to, the, to understanding. Try to create something, and then if you can do, then you understand it. The other motivation for robot scientists is technological to make uh, science more productive. Robot scientists can work cheaper, faster, more accurately, and longer than human beings. They can work 24 7, and they can also be more easily multiplied. To grow a new, to grow a new human being, a uh, scientist takes about 20 years, whereas once we have working robot scientists, we can make many of them quickly. And another important uh, motivation for robot scientists is the quality of the science. When a robot scientist uh, executes and runs and makes conclusions about experiments, everything is semantically clear. And that's quite different from when a human being does it. The robot scientist records everything in semantic detail and clarity. This makes repeating uh, and replicating the experiments much easier than in traditional science. I've been working on this for 20 years with my colleagues. In the initial robot scientist project, we showed that the different steps in the cycle of science could be executed, but we had very simple robotics and we only could demonstrate uh, the rediscovery of known science. In the Adam project, which I'll discuss in a bit of detail, we showed that uh, you could fully automate the, the whole cycle of science using robotics and AI. And we discovered some novel science, what Adam did. Using Eve, we've applied the same idea to a more important uh, application area, that of tropical diseases. And we're also using Eve now for systems biology. So Adam. And some pictures of Adam. The application area for Adam was what's called functional genomics in the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So this is the organism which is used to make uh, bread and wine and beer and whiskey. But in biology and medicine, it's used as a model for human cells. 
So yeast is what's, it's what's known as a eukaryotic organism, and human beings are also eukaryotes, as are plants. But it's much easier to uh, grow and experiment with yeast than it is for human cells. And it's much simpler organism and easier to grow. So back in 1998, uh, yeast was sequ sequenced for the first time, the first eukaryotic sequence uh, organism. Uh, it's got roughly 6,000 genes compared to the 25,000 in human beings. But still to this day, roughly 15% of the genes, we don't know their function. So Adam was designed to try to automatically discover the functions of genes in yeast. And the tools that used for that are what are called deletant knockout strains. So these are yeast strains which have had genes knocked out. And the idea is that when you notice something different about them because of the missing gene, that informs you about the function of that gene. This is similar to trying to understand how a car works by removing uh, parts of the car and looking to see what's different. So if you remove the steering wheel and you can't steer, then you infer that the steering wheel is to do with steering. That's the logic which is used uh, in systems, well, in functional genomics. To have a computer or AI system automatically do science, you need to formalize everything. We use ro logic programming to represent the background knowledge. Uh, in particular, metabolism. Metabolism is how uh, a yeast turns its food, which is basically just sugars and minerals, into more yeast. And so we model metabolism as a, as a directly labeled hypergraph. I'll explain a little bit about that later. We used abduction to infer new hypotheses. We used active learning to decide efficient experiments. And we used other types of machine learning to decide on the meaning of experimental results. Okay, and I'll go in a bit more detail about this, so the background knowledge. So the art, one of the arts of doing science is to build models of the, uh, of the physical world, the biological world. So we need to make a, a model of yeast metabolism, which is uh, accurate enough about the, the real system to be able to accurately predict the result of experiments but also simple enough to actually reason with. So we built this logical cell model uh, using logic programming. So we're using logic as a programming language, in particular Prolog. Uh, and essentially we model metabolism as a labeled hypergraph with the metabolites as nodes and enzymes as arcs. And we wanted to relate this model to what was observed by the robotic system when it did the experiments. We do this through the concept of a path from the cell inputs, these are the metabolites in the growth medium, to all the cell outputs. These are the essential compounds which metabolism must make. And if there is this path in the graph, then the model predicts that the cell can grow. And you can experimentally, well, the robot can experimentally test this by doing different experiments of knockout strains of yeast. So we have a small part of the pathway of yeast metabolism here. Uh, at the top left, we can see glycerate 2-phosphate, and that's the input position. At the bottom right, we have tyrosine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan. These are aromatic amino acids which all living cells must be able to manufacture or eat. In this model, here, this little bit of the model, uh, the objects in black are metabolites, small molecules, and the arrows are labeled with uh, blue IDs, which are the genes encoding the enzymes for these reactions. So we've abstracted uh, metabolism into this graph modeling formalism. The model has about a thousand ORFs, and these are genes and about a thousand enzymes so it's quite a large thing to for this ai to play around with and it encompasses most of what we know about yeast metabolism okay so that's the background knowledge mostly in logic and probability theory this system uh, adam needed to have an automated way of forming novel hypotheses If you read the philosophy of science, it says that science is based around uh, hypotheses and deduction. Uh, 
And forming the hypothesis is supposed to be the hard part, the, the leaps of imagination, the eureka moments where you have this great idea and leap out of the bath. In biology, most hypothesis generation is what is termed abductive, not inductive. And I'll explain what that means later on. So Ab Adam used abductive inference to infer missing arcs and labels in its metabolic graph. These were the new hypotheses, which are once these were inferred by abduction, they could then use uh, these missing arcs and labels to deductively infer the observed experimental results. So that's how science works. You make a hypothesis and then you see whether it's uh, deductively uh, results of that hypothesis are confirmed by experiment. So here's ex what I uh, mean by deduction, abduction, and induction. So here's an example of deduction. You have a rule, all swans are white. You have a fact that Daffy is a swan. Therefore, you can infer deductively that Daffy is white. And the beautiful thing about deduction is that if the rule and the fact are true, then you can only infer new truths using deduction. Deduction is the... Uh, basis of mathematics you know you have a set of axioms and rules of inference and you deduce uh, uh, new theorems it's also the basis of computer science when a computer executes it's essentially just doing deduction that's what uh, Turing uh, how that Turing came to the idea of a computer was through deduction unfortunately deduction is insufficient to, uh, to do science to develop new ideas. You need some other way of forming new ideas. Deduction just tells you the consequences of what you already know. So one approach to forming new ideas is abduction. So you have an example here of abduction. You have rule, all swans are white. You have a fact that Daffy is white. Then you can infer abductively that Daffy is a swan. And the thing to note here is that that isn't necessarily the case but it's one possible hypothesis which you could test by catching Daffy. Uh, if you people read the, uh, the novels of Sherlock Holmes and the short stories, he often says that I deduce, you know, that the murderer was the butler because of the footprints in the library, things like that. He's technically incorrect there. What Sherlock Holmes is doing is abduction. He's making a forming a likely hypothesis to explain the observations of the footprints in the library and things like that. But it's not deduction. There's always some other possible explanation. So in biology, most uh, hypothesis formation is abductive. You're formalizing a likely explanation for what you observe experimentally. And of course, uh, Daffy is a duck. Uh, the other way of forming new ideas, uh, new hypotheses, is through induction. Uh, machine learning is mostly abduction. So you have a, here's an example of abduction. Daffy is a swan in white. Tweety is a swan in white. And from facts like that, you can infer that all swans are white. And uh, this is also not guaranteed to be true. Uh, even though this example that all swans are white goes back to Aristotle, uh, 2,400 years ago, and it was taught in European universities for a thousand years, swans are not all white. When people first reached Australia, they found black swans. So that is, uh, when you have machine learning systems, they're not, the generalizations of machine learning are not necessarily guaranteed to be correct. You have to have some sort of probabilistic argument justifying them. Okay, so that's the basic ideas of Adam. It's going to use abduction to generate the hypothesis to explain uh, genes which in, uh, catalyze reactions in the metabolism of yeast. For instance, here we have uh, a missing enzyme between charismate and prefinate. Which of the 6,000 genes encodes that enzyme? That's the type of experimental problem which was faced by Adam. So given hypotheses, uh, Adam had the automated way of forming efficient experiments to decide between them. 
for instance, we have two hypotheses here about the uh, gene encoding this enzyme from chrismate to prefinate. And these hypotheses can be tested by experiments. So you can grow the mutant YER152CD in environment plus or minus prefinate. So here, if you see this uh, particular model, if you if you're looking here between charismate and prefinate, if you have deleted the correct gene, then this, the yeast will not be able to grow because there's no way to go from the starting position to the three end positions. There's a break in the graph. But if you add prefinate to the growth media, then you can start from here and then you can grow. So these two observations would be consistent with the hypothesis that the gene that's been deleted is this gene. And this is the reasoning process Adam used, and it's similar to that was used in the 1930s to work out these metabolic pathways in the first place. Okay, so given a set of hypotheses, we wish to infer an experiment which will finish efficiently discriminate between them. We had a Bayesian formalism where every experiment is, has a probability of being correct and every experiment has an associated cost. This is the cost of the actual chemicals used in the experiments. As these chemicals varied in cost by many orders of magnitude, it makes a lot of sense to choose the chemicals carefully. The uh, experimental task, the optimal thing you can do, we argue, is to choose a series of experiments which minimizes the expected cost of eliminating all but one hypothesis. So that's the goal. Unfortunately, uh, in the 1970s, uh, Russian mathematician Fedorov showed that this problem is, in general, uh, NP complete, meaning that it's uh, hard to find efficient algorithms to do this. Uh, so it's impossible to find efficient algorithms. Assuring P doesn't equal NP. Uh, however, it can be shown this problem uh, maps onto the same problem as finding an optimal decision tree. And we know from practice and theory that we can find near optimal solutions in polynomial time. So it's shown that the strategy used by Adam uh, outperforms that of all but the best of human beings on test problems. So the next part of the cycle is to have a robot to execute the experiments. Here's a, a diagram of Adam, which it was about five meters by four meters by three meters. And Adam generated and confirmed novel functional genomics hypotheses concerning the identity of genes, encoding enzymes and catalyzing orphan reactions in the metabolic network of yeast. So we argue that these uh, generated hypotheses and experiments confirming the hypotheses make Adam the first machine to autonomously discover novel scientific knowledge. It both hypothesized and experimentally confirmed new scientific knowledge. And we manually confirmed these hypotheses and conclusions by doing what's called gold standard experiments. We purified the gene product and showed that it had the enzymic functions predicted by uh, Adam. So here's a list of some of the novel signs discovered by Adam. Okay, formalizing science. So, the goal of science is to increase our knowledge of the natural world through the performance of experiments. I argue that this knowledge should be expressed in formal logical languages, not in natural languages, not in English or uh, French or Mandarin or any other language. It should be in a formal logical language because uh, only formal logical languages have the semantic clarity necessary to this the free exchange of scientific knowledge. And uh, human languages are designed uh, for human beings to, uh, to persuade human beings to do things, to make them fall in love with you, to write poetry. They're not designed for semantic clarity, which is necessary for science. Logic is designed for that, and it's a much better way of describing science, I would argue. This idea is not a new one. It goes back to the 17th century and the origin of the scientific uh, method. 
But it's become increasingly important now when computers are sharing more and more of the burden of doing science. They understand logic much better. Well, logic suits them and it makes things clear, which is what's necessary for the free exchange of knowledge with humans and computers. So robot scientists are an excellent test bed to develop methodologies for formalizing science. It's possible to completely capture and curate all the aspects of the scientific process, the, the uh, formation of hypotheses, the formation of the experiments to test them, the reason that conclusions are reached from the experimental observations, etc. We've developed an ontology to enable the uh, formalization of uh, the experimental results of Adam and free exchange of data. So we wanted to make it clear that Adam, there was no sort of uh, hand waving, everything that Adam did was automated. So we formalized this experimental work. This involved 10,000 different research units in the nested tree-like structure. So what they do is they logically connect the 6.6 million observations to Adam's hypotheses, experimental goals, results, etc. So Adam, uh, was reasoning about things like genes and proteins and enzymes, but it didn't actually observe them. All it observed was optical density measurements. And this is quite similar to a lot of science. You know, the uh, astronomers talk about uh, black holes and supernova and things, but all they actually physically observe are like photons, mostly. So he has a long logical argument from the actual observations to its experimental results and conclusions. Here's a small part of that 10,000 node tree. Each node in the tree is essentially a, a small hypothesis. Uh, here's a traversal down that tree. Uh, we're going to traverse up the tree. Every word underlined is from the ontology. Ontology is a logical formalization of an area of, of inquiry. So it says here this observation one is a part of replicate one, which was part of experiment one which is part of a trial, which was part of a cycle, which was part of a study, which was part of an investigation, etc. So all this was formalized, that the meaning of an observation, the replicates, and this put the, uh, the skeleton onto the argument of Adam's research. Here's a, little, a bit more of it. So every one of these 10,000 nodes was logically described. Here's in data log and OWL, which is another logical language. These describe the, the particular hypotheses and the evidence supporting them. Okay, uh, our second robot scientist was called Eve. There's, it's a much better looking and far better designed robot than Adam was. And its application area was an early stage drug design, in particular for neglected tropical diseases uh, like malaria, Schistosomiasis, Leishmania, Shigas. So for malaria, you know, hundreds of millions of people a year get malaria. About a million people die. Uh, Schistosomiasis infects a quarter of a billion people. Maybe 100,000 people die. Leishmania infects hundreds of thousands of people. Maybe 50,000 people die. 50,000 people die from Shigas disease a year. These are all horrible diseases. Uh, but they're neglected by the pharmaceutical industry because not the people that get these diseases are generally too poor to pay what the pharmaceutical companies think that uh, they should pay. So they think there's no profit to be made, uh, which is unfortunate and uh, outrageous, I think, in this 21st century. Uh, so one motivation uh, for doing that is to help the world. They're actually, these diseases are actually easier to treat than many of the things which the pharmaceutical industry focuses on, like uh, diabetes and cancer, because we actually understand how to treat these diseases. All you have to do is kill the parasite, and the parasite is normally highly diverged from human beings. So the malaria parasite diverged probably about 
a billion, a billion and a half years ago. So it's very different from a human being. So it's easy to find something different about it. And we understand clearly what's going wrong. Whereas for diabetes type 2, it's what's wrong is something to do with uh, metabolism of sugars, but how you intervene with a single drug is very un unclear. And with cancer, that cancer diverged from you only a few years ago at most. So it's hard to find something different about it and kill it. Whereas malaria is e relatively easy to kill. But the pharmaceutical industry is not interested because of profit. So we formalize the problem, we use graphs and standard chemoinformatic methods to represent background knowledge. We used induction this time, not abduction, stand to form machine learning models, which are called quantitative structure activity relationship models. These are little mathematical models when you, which when you input a chemical structure, predict the activity of that chemical at say, uh, killing malaria. And we used active learning to decide on efficient experiments. So active learning is a branch of machine learning where the computer can choose its next example to look at. And there's clearly a close analogy between active learning and scientific method. So uh, I won't go into this in too much detail, but basically we automated the early stages of uh, drug design. This involves screening a library against an assay. Uh, confirming hits, which are compounds which are active. We have to confirm them uh, because they're, as for machine learning people, it's the class imbalance. Most compounds are not active, so we need to confirm the active ones. And then we learn cycles of uh, active learning, testing new compounds from the library. Here's uh, mod a picture of Eve's hardware, it's about the same size as Adam, about five meters by five meters, a couple of meters high. It costs about a million dollars. The uh, fanciest piece of kit is the acoustic liquid handling robot, which uh, pings little, uses sound to ping little micro uh, 2.5 nanoliter droplets uh, with, with the drug in it. And this is the most efficient and cheap way of moving small amounts of liquid around, also the most accurate way. Okay, see if we can actually show Eve running. So these robot arms are similar to the ones used in, in car factories. They're, uh, they don't have enough, don't have sensors very much. They're just very precise in their movement. They're picking up what are called micro titer plates. They have 384 little experimental, uh, well, little vessels to do experiments on the plates. They're about the size of a hand, each one of these uh, micro titer plates. You can see the little 384 little. Uh, wells for which can do experiments in so we're going to well eve's going to ping uh chemicals which is decided to experiment with into these wells and it's going to do that by turning it upside down and the little droplets will stick to it uh through surface tension so this is the micro titer plate with the different chemicals so it's just selected a subset of these to test its little machine learning model Now it's using sound to ping the droplets onto the, the black plate, which you saw. Now it's taking that plate and going to add what's called the assay, which is involved uh, using uh, synthetic biology to make yeast cells look like humans and malaria parasites. So one type of yeast will be made to look like the malaria one, one will be like the human one, and the assay is to find a drug which kills the malaria looking like yeast against the human ones. Okay, so now that's what's happening here is that the assay, these two types of 
modified yeast, one like human, one like malaria, are, are being plated onto the 384 wells. Okay, I show time is short. So we did a lot of experiments to show that uh, using AI to learn models during the early stage drug design is more efficient than the, the approach taken by the pharmaceutical industry, uh, typically. Uh, this idea of using AI in screening has now been taken up by uh, large pharmaceutical companies. The little model here is this, I modeling the economics of drug design and on this graph here the blue green area shows that this is where ai is more efficient and the red is where you have to just do everything the most interesting result of it was this compound called triclosan uh, this used to be in colgate toothpaste uh, i've swallowed a lot of it so it's very safe uh, it was actually our contribution is that we've discovered that it works through inhibiting uh, an enzyme called dihydrofolic reductase, DHFR. An Indian team found it worked on FAST2. Uh, but FAST2 isn't present uh, in blood parasites of malaria. So that's not the way it works normally. And we've shown it works against the Plasmodium falciparum. This is the variety of malaria that causes most deaths in the world, mostly babies in Africa. But it also works against Plasmodium vivax, which is the type of malaria present uh, in India and South America, and, and used to be very common in Britain as well, and killed several English kings. Okay, the latest robot scientist in the building is called Genesis. Uh, it's going to have, uh, this is a small section of what Genesis will look like. Uh, we're going to use it to tackle, try to understand how eukaryotic cells work. Uh, it will be able to do, instead of just one or two cycles of closed loop execution, it's going to be able to do 10,000 closed loop cycles in parallel. So that's equivalent to about what a thousand biologists do, because. Uh, it will have the capability of experimentally doing the amount of work for a, of a thousand biologists. And I'll do this because it's going to use microfluidics to do the experiments. And the most challenging task will be able to will be to develop the AI to design, plan, execute thousands of experiments in parallel. No one's ever attempted to do anything on the same scale before. Uh, and AI is needed because of the complexity of biological systems. You know, even these simple sy model systems are incredibly complicated. There's thousands of proteins, small molecules interacting together in complicated spatial temporal ways. And Occam's razor, the idea that simpler explanations are the best, doesn't work very well with biology because of the complicated uh, evolutionary history of biological systems. So there's not enough PhDs in the world to disentangle them soon. We need robot scientists to scale up things. The application to Mary is uh, systems biology of eukaryotic systems using especially yeast as a model for eukaryotic systems. So humans are eukaryotes as are plants. So if we ever want to have rational medicine and agriculture, we need to under first understand how eukaryotic cells work. And Genesis is targeted to do that. And I wanted to finish on work on this idea of the noble Turing challenge which uh, started this year in February uh, so in uh, chess and go uh, there's a continuum of ability from novices up to grandmasters and uh, over time computers uh, at the time of Turing played uh, very badly uh, but now computer my mobile phone could easily be the world champion at chess so computers have uh, slowly gotten better over a period of 50, 70 years at chess. I argue that there is also a continuum of ability in science from the simple type of research that Adam and Eve can do through up to 
the type of science that human scientists can do up to the grand masters of science like Newton and Einstein. So there's a continuum of ability in science. And if you accept that, I argue that uh, computers are going to get better and better at science. Uh, whereas human beings are just staying the same level. Perhaps we're actually getting worse at science because I don't think there's many Newtons and Einsteins uh, around in science anymore. And the physics Nobel Prize winner Frank Wilczewicz 10 years ago said that in 100 years time, the best physicist will be a machine. So the Newton, uh, sorry, the Nobel Turing challenge is to uh, push that forward to 2050. So uh, in February of this year, the, at the Alan Turing Institute, supported by the Office of Naval Research, we had a workshop in London uh, on AI and scientific discovery. I was one of the co-organizers with Yolanda Gill from USC and Hiroaki Kitano from Sony and the Systems Biology Institute in Japan. And we agreed on this, Nuring, this Nobel Turing Challenge to develop AI scientists capable of making Nobel quality scientific discoveries highly autonomously at the level comparable, comparable and possibly superior to the best human scientists by 2050. So that's uh, 40 years earlier than Frank Wilczewicz. So this is uh, this grand challenge which we, we're starting. I uh, hear the, uh, the organizers uh, in London in, in February, just before the COVID virus shut down everything. And uh, we want to make it, uh, quotes, a planetary initiative. Uh, we want uh, to collaborate across borders, uh, across disciplinary boundaries. Uh, and if it's going to continue to the year 2050, we need to have an organization which will survive that long. Most uh, funding bodies only think of a five-year horizon, possibly 10 years, not more. Uh, currently, the, uh, the initiative is a US, UK, and Japanese initiative. So they're, the Department of Energy in, in the US will probably fund some facilities. There's facilities being built in Japan. And hopefully in UK, there will also, also be facilities. And in particular, I'm interested in uh, dedicated wet lab facilities where AI scientists can develop software to run an automated lab experiments without the need to know how to run a wet lab. So this would be particular facilities designed so that AI scientists can develop new techniques for science and try them out on real scientific experiments and real robots without having to have the large capital costs involved in doing that themselves. And I hope that India will take part in this challenge. Uh, I think there, uh, there's a clear strategic need for India to fund AI. I, I think that's obvious. It's essential for the future of India. It's future, it's future in science, in medicine, in technology, and, and in defense. Uh, and it surprises me as an outsider that uh, the, the priorities of AI, of science in India, you know, I, it's amazing to me that you're going to spend $200 million on a neutrino observatory, uh, equally large amounts of money of maybe larger amounts digging tunnels for gravity uh, detectors in India. That money I think would be far better spent on uh, developing uh, AI and science, I think. And, and it would be fantastic, actually, if we could have an international collaborative center in, in Goa to do AI and science. Goa is a beautiful place that you could attract foreign scientists to, to Goa, where it's in other parts of India, it's like Delhi, is not nearly so attractive to foreigners. Okay, to conclude, uh, I have this vision of uh, collaboration between human and robot scientists that Working together, humans and robots will produce better science than either can alone. Uh, and even though they are, I think it was in 1998 that uh, Kasparov got beaten by a computer for the first time. Uh, the world champion was beaten by a computer that was over 20 years ago. But still to this day, uh, computers plus humans are better at chess than humans alone. So humans and robot scientists are better at science than humans alone or robots alone. I think that robot, I believe that scientific knowledge should be primarily expressed in logic of associated probabilities. 
and published using the semantic web. The existing publication method in science is, is broken. And this vision, I think, will have uh, improved productivity of science and societal benefits, better food security, better medicines, etc. I want to conclude, so I would say that science is a wonderful application area for AI. Uh, automation is increasingly important in scientific research. I argue that the robot scientist concept is the next logical step in the automation of science. Uh, the robot scientist Adam was the first machine to have discovered novel scientific knowledge. The robot scientist Eve uh, has found not new lead compounds for neglected tropical diseases. And the robot scientists are, I think, needed for 21st century science. I'd like to thank my collaborators and the robot scientist team and at the lab and in Japan. And I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Thanks very much. Yeah, so it was a great, great talk listening to you about all the work that you have done. Uh, it will be great to see India also participating in sort of pharmaceutical research. Like India is one of the lead in the pharmaceutical sector and using AI that government can invest in to like even help all the countries. That That is what I believe. So yes, we have some questions in the question box. So the first question is, uh, do you see robot scientists like Adam being applied to one day to analyze human genomes, perhaps for the purposes of identifying the hereditary uh, diseases or to simplify the, to simply find the function of unknown sequences of human genome? Well, I certainly see there's a role for this AI in understanding uh, the mapping between genetics, environment, and phenotype. Yes, so this is a large class of related problem where you know the the genotype, that's like the genetic sequence of an organism. You have some knowledge about its environment and you want to be able to understand the phenotype. So a phenotype could be a disease or there's a very similar problem I've been interested in in uh, agriculture in rice genetics. So you know the genetics of the rice plant, you know its environment. Can you predict uh, how good a rice plant it will be? Uh, will it be able to be salt tolerant? How will it be able to produce uh, a lot of seeds? These are sort. Of, these type of problems are very similar to the medical ones, where you're trying to predict a phenotype through this. And I think machine learning is essential to that task. Yes. Yeah. I hope this the problem with human medicine is that it's quite different. experiments are completely inexpensive. That's why I think that the best way to progress in medicine is first to understand simpler systems like yeast. Yes. So the next question is, uh, how is the background knowledge, like using knowledge graphs and all, explore, exploited in like, the research that is there with this sort of biology in general? Like, using knowledge graphs for phenotypes and genes and well it's a large open question how best to do that uh in my group we uh we uh like to use uh, logic programming to represent background knowledge it's uh it's a very flexible way of doing that more flexible and a richer representation than just knowledge graphs uh, but it's harder to scale, arguably. So another question is like, can Adam, Adam or Eve technique be used to explore genomics to map viruses like the one that is there for COVID-19? And then this can help us accelerate to make vaccines for such pandemics that and prevent pandemics to happen again. Yes, well, we need to better understand uh, well, it could have been used to look for drugs. One of the, uh, to me, shocking revelations about this whole COVID-19 uh, uh, story, I suppose, is that uh, science has not behaved particularly well, in my view, in that, uh, at least in Europe, a lot of scientists have been trying to 
use the crisis to benefit their own careers. Uh, we haven't got together and made sensible decisions, I think, about where the money is spent. Lots of people were jumping up and down and saying, give the money to me, give the money to me. Uh, I have in the past uh, campaigned in Britain to have uh, factories waiting to produce vaccines in case of uh, pandemics, but the governments uh, didn't see that as a high priority in the past. Uh, I was especially worried about uh, influenza pandemic because uh, we actually know how to make influenza vaccines quite quickly if we needed to. But most, uh, most vaccine production for influenza is to this day made using chicken eggs. So that's why it takes six months to make enough vaccine for a year in Britain because they need all these live chicken eggs. It's like a, something out of the 19th century. So we don't have, to, uh, even for influenza, where we could make a vaccine quite quickly because we know what to do. Even there, we don't have the facilities to make enough vaccine uh, in an emergency. So there's many things which could be done using laboratory automation. So I think it's more a laboratory automation problem than a AI problem. Um, okay, so uh, we are running short on time, so I'll ask like one or two questions more. So was the data-driven automated hypothesis generation majorly symbolic in nature? How did it scale to more data and especially more cases where coming up with an hypothesis required a certain deal of imagination? For example, Copernicus required certain imagination to hypothesize that the system is heliocentric, etc. Was this kind of hypothesis captured in the symbolic model? I didn't quite catch the question, but yes, the uh, the model was quite big, so it had uh, thousands of components. So it, the inference mechanism uh, wasn't purely logical in that we it used prior knowledge about biology. So there's a lot of knowledge known uh, from other organisms. So it basically used techniques from bioinformatics to help make the its hypothesis more probable. So it's they use background knowledge to constrain the search of hypothesis formation. Uh, and one last question is like, for undergraduates, how can they explore this field? Because this field requires a lot of resources that might not be available to all the undergraduates that are there. And like, how can we as undergraduates contribute to the research work going on this going on in this field? Well, uh, it's laboratory automation is expensive. That's true, but machine learning is cheap uh, to do. You can do that on a normal computer laptop. You can do interesting research on. Uh, on a cheap computer. You don't need to use supercomputers to do that. You do if you want to use the, to compete at the, the highest level of deep learning, but there's lots of other branches of machine learning where we, you have more than enough facilities on a small computer or even a phone. So you. So there, I think, uh, machine learning, was, there's lots of need for new ideas there. Mm, and, yeah. and a small computer is sufficient to do that. Computers are incredibly powerful, even small ones nowadays, you know? Yeah, the GPUs are now up pretty easily available as well. We would have died to have a computer as powerful as a mobile phone when I was a PhD student. Huh. So, yeah, thank you for, like, having this talk and enlightening me. Yes. And I, I apologize for uh, confusion at the start of the timing. Yeah, no, I should. Okay, huh. thank you. Thank you.